first jobs were like working with data, doing like data entry and something administrative. And then um, the first time that I really saw the power of data analytics, I guess was. This episode of KNN was brought to you by Pandio. More on them in a little. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Lillian Pearson. Lillian helps data professionals transform into world-class data leaders and entrepreneurs. To date, she's educated over 1 million data professionals on AI, and over 10% of the data entrepreneurs that have worked with her have landed six-figure contracts within the first seven months. In this episode, Lillian shares the story of her early affinity towards data. As a child, it was fun and easy for her to begin working with spreadsheets. We also touch on her hands-on work using data analytics to help design reaction protocols for substituting hydrogen with deuterium atoms from within nucleic acids. Toward the end, we explore how she made the transition into data entrepreneurship, and we both discuss our experiences growing as content creators. I hope you enjoy the episode. Lillian, thank you so much for coming on. You've run a really incredible uh, like data-related business, uh, starting early in your career as as someone who, who's doing hands-on things and moving into the entrepreneurial space. And I think it's fascinating how you help people who want to become data entrepreneurs really maximize their results there. So today, I think we're going to have an awesome conversation learning about your story and how you went from working on a hands-on role and moved into more of the entrepreneurship and found your, your kind of passion for that. And also, I want to understand you know, what your life is like working in another country. Obviously you're not in the US right now, but there's some really cool stuff associated with that. Again, thank you so much for coming in. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be able to have this conversation with you and to even know you, um, even to have the chance to know you, Ken. Absolutely. And you know, this has been a long time coming. We're, we're in like the worst possible time zones to be able to do a podcast. So I'm really happy we made this work and, and we got things scheduled. So. Uh, the first thing that I that I ask everyone, it's something I'm always fascinated with because my own journey into data uh, science is very interesting. How did you first get interested with, uh, like I guess, like the technical things and data to begin with? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, so I actually have always been um, curious about computers ever since, um, like my mother married my stepfather and he had this old computer. It was back in like 1985 and he had like programming books in his office, which was off limits. So naturally I wanted to go in there and figure out what's in this box and what does this book mean? Cause it was all like programming and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so I've just naturally like by the time I was seven, I was getting into his computer and learning how to use a program called, I can't even remember, it was like WordStar. And then there was this other one that was like a spreadsheet. It was in 1987. So I would go in there and I would try and figure out like play with the cells in the spreadsheet. So I've always just been kind of like really into that sort of thing. And then um, my first jobs were, like working with data, doing like data entry and something administrative. And then um, the first time that I really saw the power of data analytics, I guess was when I was 17 and I went away to a, um, a chemistry research program um, two times in the summer over in Houston. And they had a machine for NMR uh, which is nuclear magnetic resonance. And so it would basically, it used data analytics and it would show you uh, a spectrum, you know, a line chart, and that would help you know what atoms were on the molecule. And I needed to teach myself enough organic chemistry to design up a reaction protocol to change one of those hydrogen atoms out for deuterium. So I didn't know organic chemistry, but I had a book and I had the analytics. And so I just did trial and error with the analytics and I would run my sample and you could see by the, by the peak, the size of the peak, how much of the, of the hydrogen was going away and being replaced. And so by, by that, I was able to 
you know, to make the substitution and create this compound, um, these nucleic acids that they're still using today. That was a long time ago. <laughs> so that was like my first. And then since then, it's just been like went into engineering and then data is just like, data has been everything that I've pretty much always done, you know? It's just natural for me to, I just gravitate towards data. That's awesome. Well, I, I love that. I love the kind of origin story. It sounds like almost a superhero origin story where, you know, there's this thing you weren't supposed to be doing. And maybe that's an interesting parenting technique is, you know, you like hide the vegetables or something and, and the kids will want to eat them. <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah. I, I really love that. I think something that um, I found really appealing to data is that it's kind of like a, like a mystery and you, you don't know what you can necessarily do with its components, right? And so when I was looking into data science to begin with, it was this mysterious subject that I knew the results it could produce, but mm -hmm. I didn't know um, like what was under the hood. And the more I learned what was under the hood, the more I got interested in the results and the more I got interested in, in the process and learning about doing more of it. And that kind of, the, the mystery surrounding it or the intrigue kind of led me to keep going deeper and the fact that it was always around in, I guess, like the sports I was interested in and, and the types of problems I was looking to solve, yeah. just like you, it kind of uh, became more natural for me. And, uh, you know, I think you're one of the first people who uh, had mentioned that data was part of your life for a long period of time. Some people say that, you know, like, you know, they've been technical, but it wasn't necessarily the data part. Um, See, I'm the other way, like the coding and... Um, building like machine, like build, I'm not a, I'm not a developer by any means. So like building applications has never been my thing. I learned to code just to do data science. And it, that was never really something that, you know, I don't want to sit around all day and code. That's just not what I want to do. But the data part of it, the working with data in like, so I'm attracted to data for because of the power, the, the powerful results it can generate. And so I've, I found that that's basically like people have their different, like what is it about tech and data that, that really attracts them? So for me, it's, I'm really interested in the results and how do I get these results? Some people are really interested in the tech and how it works, like, you know, building the thing and like doing the detail part of it. Um, and that's fine too, but those usually like branch out into different types of roles where, you know, you're like, I wouldn't be happy working as a developer, but I would be happy working as a doing data strategy because it's more like just, you can see the outcome. I think that might, I don't know. I don't want to gender myself. So I'll just leave it at that. No, I think that that's uh, it, at any level of, of this field, the results should be the most important thing, right? And they should be the most fun thing. I mean, I was always trying to chase performance with data. And so like, yeah. whether that was in, in my own performance or understanding how I could like improve my golf game or understanding how I could predict what would happen in sports events to, you know, like play fantasy sports, whatever that might be. It was all about, hey, could I use these things to, to transform uh, or, or come to a better solution on the other end? and and actually like make money or do whatever it was. Um, but that's, I mean, that's like a beautiful thing that, that it does fuel that fire because I'm, I don't necessarily enjoy coding as much as I enjoy seeing the results of running the code and getting the findings and seeing what the power of that is. Um, so see, if you were to take, I have a quiz I just uh, recently released, we released, it's called Data Superheroes Quiz. And if you were to take that quiz, it's just like, a, really like 45 seconds fun quiz but if you were to take it i'm pretty sure you would either come out as a data leader or a data entrepreneur but certain people like my husband oh no he's he's a like data you know yeah. implementer he wants to do that and that's what lights his fire which is awesome well i'll, I'll actually link that that quiz in the uh, in the description to the video for people to experiment with that'll be kind of fun and <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely take it myself later there um so I'm interested, you, you'd mentioned you studied un engineering in school. Um, I'd be, I'd like to know like what type of engineering and if that ended up uh, being like a good choice for you. You think you could have done something uh, different and it would have helped you more in your career 
or like really didn't matter in the long run. And it just, um, things worked out how they worked out and it, it, it's a good thing either way. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I, so I have got my degree and my professional license in environmental engineering, which is a branch of civil engineering. And, uh, one could argue that, you know, I used to say that I wish I had gotten like a statistics degree or a um, computer science degree. And yes, that would be helpful. But now looking back, um, each of these, each of these different types of degrees, each of these pathways leads to experience, right? So when I worked ever since I, you know, I worked with data in environmental engineering. That's how I got my first job was being really good at GIS already, which is geographic information systems and like spatial modeling and stuff. So um, I had the experience, I get to work with data, but, and do like sophisticated evaluations, but the crux of our deliverables was strategic plans, technical plans, implementation plans. And then we would send those and actually, you know, there was contractors and subcontractors that would actually go do the construction because it was built systems. And so that gave me a lot of exposure to consulting and strategic consulting and technical consulting. So now looking back where I'm at now, I wouldn't have had that type of experience if I had gone and done, like if I had done, I think if I had done something more technical, like more like software, you know, um, like computer science, I probably would have gone into being a software developer, not a strategic planner for technical projects. And, you know, in both of those, you know, so it helped basically is what I'm saying. Like if I wanted to be an implementation person, it would have helped me to have a computer science degree a lot more than the degree I have now, but I don't want to do that anyway. I'm more of like a strategic, like leader type. That's just like my gravitational, like that's how I go. So the experience I got as an environmental engineer was actually perfect because it gave me a lot of what I needed to do what I do now and offer like my data strategy action plan and teaching people how to build strategic plans for technical, for data implementation. So they can protect, protect their business ROI, right? Which is not something you're gonna learn how to do, I don't think in computer science. Yep, I, I certainly would agree with that for, for the most part. I think that, um, you know, there's something that a lot of people are really held up on is, is the degree that I did correct? Or like, you know, for, for whatever it is that I want to do in the future. And I think honestly, if you have a degree that is like data ancillary, even like I, I did economics in undergrad and I, I don't know many data scientists who were like, who went down that route necessarily, but there economics are things- Economics is hard. It's great it, actually. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't think it, at, the, at the level I was doing it in college, it was very difficult, but at the higher level, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, I found that the skills that I learned from that are not skills that the average data scientist would have. And so that even though I wasn't doing the pure computer science or I didn't do, um, you know, like a, a statistics degree, the little difference that I had was actually appealing in some way, as long as I had a baseline for those other skills. And it also yeah, probably- you can pick them up. You can exactly. just take some classes and it's like, that's where it's not, it's not, it was never that, it was hard actually in 2012 when I went about like look at getting myself skilled up in data science because there was like one course, one course on it. It was the Andrew Ning course on Coursera. It was out in 2012. Other than that, there were like books on statistics. There was book, there was things on Python and I had to like cobble it together from the raw resources. There wasn't like data science training. Yeah, there's a lot um, of it now, so. <laughs> oh, now it's just like, there's just, there's, I feel like there's no need for, and well, there is need for more, but there's no more need for like basic data science courses. It, there's a huge demand, there's a huge need in my opinion for, uh, for basically speciating, getting a lot more like, like um, so one of my clients does marketing mix modeling, does really, really, really well for himself doing marketing mix modeling um, in his business. And there's not a course out there for that. It's data science. There's so many topics we need courses for in data science that are um, 
it's just they're not the generalist courses. There's too many of those. I have a few myself. <laughs> How do I? So, no, I, I agree. I, I think, you know, the, the future of the learning is going to be on the specialized resources. I mean, even related to just platforms and tools, there's a lot of that out there. I mean, it, yeah. I, I almost see a market going towards like a la carte things, smaller courses where it's like, hey, how do you do this very specific use case? I love that too. Yeah. That's what I want. You know, I don't want to like wade through a bunch of stuff. I just want to go in and get what I need because you don't need to go through tons of theory and stuff, right? We just need the little nugget we need to take away so we can get through our next step. Yeah. 100%. And also, we don't want it to be overwhelming. <laughs> please. <laughs> if you're creating a course, please. <laughs> now, a quick word from this episode's sponsor, Pandio. Taking advantage of machine learning doesn't just mean that you have a lot of data. It means that you have the ability to access, to query, and to move that data in a seamless manner across your enterprise. Pandio is the only data orchestration layer that enables you to connect different data sources query data in place as if it were a single database and move that data at scale. Let your data science teams focus on optimizing the models for data-driven decisions and let Pandio focus on the logistics. Go to pandio.com, that's P-A-N-D-I-O.com for a free trial to see how Pandio can drive massive value for your data transformation. Now back to the episode. No, I, I agree. And so one thing, just dialing back a little bit, after, after, after your education, I'd love to dive into your first impressions of like your first data an like analysis role in general. Like, what was that experience like for you? Is that where you started to see opportunities coming about uh, for entrepreneurship for some of these other things? Or was it just like, hey, uh, I'm in this role, I'm gonna to do this for a couple of years and, and see where it turns out? Or was it like, I, I'm in this and I don't like it. And here's what I don't like about it. And that's why I'm going to change things. Okay. Yeah, no, actually it was, it was the other way around. So I was an environmental engineer and I decided that that was, I wasn't satisfied with that. So I decided I'll become a lawyer and I'll be a, become a patent lawyer. So I decided oh, I'll go to work full-time as an engineer. And then at nighttime, I'll go to law school, which was just a ridiculous, like, just if you have that idea, don't do it. <laughs> um, so anyway, I ended up just like, I found out I don't want to be a lawyer. And I didn't really want to be an environment. I didn't want to work as an environmental engineer. Um, and that's good because there were no jobs because it was the collapse of the 2008 bubble. And I was just putting so many resumes in, resumes in, resumes in, and I couldn't find a job doing what I did before anywhere. And I realized I was in um, Bolivia. It was like 2011. I had gone down to La Paz, Bolivia, and I was like on this hostel floor thinking, and then it hit me how futile my job search efforts were. So I realized, okay, I had put in 600, about 600 applications for an envir another environmental engineering job. I got like, no, I didn't know how to do job searches really very well either, apparently. Well, the landscape like, then was also very different. I mean, LinkedIn wasn't as popularized, like. Well, actually was... at that same time, I got a book finally after all of that. And I learned the digital, I learned the digital approach to job searching. It still works today. And I got a job right away. Like huh. just four, I put in like four red CVs and I had like three interviews and a job right away, which, but before that happened, like, so while I was down there in South America, I literally put in that CV as one of the four with my new, new approach. And I ended up getting this job and it was for GIS. It was for the title or whatever, it was a government geographic information systems. Um, but I had already decided because, okay, so the kicker was not only had I put in 600 resumes, um, I was working as a legal secretary because that's the only thing I could find for like eight bucks an hour. So I was working like 40 hours a week and then all night putting in TVs. Hadn't gotten a job. And I realized down in Bolivia when I was just chilling that I was actually losing less money per day doing nothing in Bolivia than I was 
working like 80 hours a week in America just because I had a renter, you know, so the offset of the cost of living and everything. And I thought, I don't ever want to go back. So why the hell am I going to go back, work 80 hours a week, make eight bucks an hour, never get a job? Like, why don't I just start my own online business and just never go back? And so it, I actually decided that was a ridiculous idea to be living in America, that lifestyle. And I decided to start my own business, but then I got that job, right? Like right. <laughs> so I went back, but I already had made up my mind that I'm going to start an online business and travel the world. And so I just started building the business as I was working and it so happened that was 2012. And that's when big data was like going straight up in terms of trending and there was no one, there was like no young people, there was like a few, there's like Hillary Mason working in the data industry um, and DJ Patil, there are some people that were kind of younger, but um, there is basically no saturation, all types of interest and I was already in a data position. So it could like turn that into like programming, like building statistical models and Python and stuff like I could kind of take the job I had and turn it into what I needed. And so I just, um, but that was all, all for the intention of once I got my engineering license to quit my job and move to, uh, for, to Koh Samoy and here I am <laughs> seven awesome. years, eight years later. <laughs> well, before we move on, I do want to make sure, and because I do want to learn more about the, the the lifestyle that you have now, obviously not in the U.S. I do want to hear what the tips were for landing the position that you did. You said it like essentially overnight oh, yeah. you changed something because that's what every listener is probably going to want to hear as well. Is like, what did you do differently that that helped you essentially get so many more offers going from yeah. uh, the volume that you were looking at? Okay, so what I did, okay, it was a book that I got, I was poor, so I got a free PDF book called Gorilla Marketing for Job Hunters, like 2.0. And it basically told me, okay, you gotta go find a job that they have what you, you have what they need. And you figure out who is the hiring manager for that job. Then you build, a, like I did a new style of CV with like, uh, logos on one side that showed like all the companies I had supported in my previous work as an employee. And um, it also was very results driven, very quantitative results driven. And each CV was custom made for the actual job. So it took a lot of time. And it was basically, this is what they're looking for. And this is how I demonstrate that I've gotten these results. It's one sheet only just you know, it's just, it was supposed to be like, wow, for them. I don't know. I'm not, <laughs> that was the last work, time I looked so. for a job. But then the other thing is that you do this kind of gutsy move where you take, instead of sending it to HR, because nothing ever makes it through HR, you just take it and you write a cover letter, basically using standard copyright. Now, now that I know what it is, it's just like ADA copywriting techno, um, technique. So you write a letter and it's basically like here, so-and-so, you're absolutely badass because of your commitment to X, Y, and Z thing. You know, so you capture their attention and um, I know you're looking to get X, Y, and Z results. That's why we should talk. I could tell you how I know, I could tell you how I have all these skills and blah, 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 but why don't we let the results speak for themselves? And then just one, two, three bullet points, like bam, 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 look at these results. That's why we should talk. I'm gonna call you on Tuesday at 3 p.m. at this number that I have for you. Um, and I look forward to speaking with you then about the position that, you know, and then you send them your CV with that cover letter. And I was like, okay, dude, well, I already sent like 600 resumes out. So I have like zero. <laughs> So I did it and I called the number I had for this person and um, they didn't pick up, but I think that that was like, that showed a lot of initiative and like, they were like basically like, okay, this person is really serious and they know what they're talking about. And I think, I mean, it just, it just works. It worked then anyway, but that was a long time ago. So I don't know if that's what you would want to do now. Awesome. Well, <laughs> that I, was 10 I, years ago. I think that 
regardless of if that would work now, that's something that's like different. Every employer is looking for someone that like one appreciates their, their company, just like general human nature. It's like this person did their homework. This person is doing something that we would look for in a business setting. If you were looking for, for example, a salesperson and they, um, they approach you in that manner, I guarantee you, you would land a job, right? Because you're essentially like selling yourself to that person that you have the skills, whatever that might be. And I think that those skills are pretty important in data science as well. I don't know if I would use exactly that approach these days, but I would actually be very interested in, in testing it. Um, maybe I'll apply for some jobs with a similar thing and see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could make some tests. Exactly. Well, you know, there's a guy, he got hired at like all of the like fang companies or whatever. And he like quit them all. And he, his whole ambition, cause he was not like a, he wanted to be an entrepreneur. So his, his whole program is how to get hired at these fang companies. Cause he's been hired at like all of them. And he's had sometimes more than one time. So he knows every single little trick in the book to get these really like fancy jobs. And that's his business. Huh? That's pretty cool. I actually have a friend who has a very similar business where he sources like the interview questions and those types of, it's a good business. Those companies are very high demand to get into. Um, I don't know if I would, it maybe it'd be a fun challenge for me to, to see if I could, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I love those types of, business. not, not if I could, if I'd want to put in the effort, I think is the, the hard part. <laughs> Because the interviews now are unbelievably difficult um, or just time consuming. But kind of moving back into your, into your work, into your entrepreneurial vision, after you'd quit and went off on your own again, how did you win your first contract? What did that look like? Um, oh, after I quit. Well, I or, did, or actually I have... even, even before, before you quit, how did you win your first contract? Okay, so I was in, um, so after Bolivia, I went back to Peru and I ran into someone who, oh, it's such a weird story. Some dude I had known from some, it's such a weird story, I can't tell you. Anyway, I had known him from the internet in Orlando and he was living in Cusco, Peru. And I was like, how are you making money, you know? And he's like, I'm, oh, get this, he was, doing dating. I, did you know that people who have dating websites are hiring people to basically do their messaging and vetting for them? And so he was doing that. He was doing that for women. So he was actually talking to other men and messaging on behalf of a woman and getting paid for it. And that was like his job. And I'm like, okay, well, how do you get a writing gig? And so he told me the site to go to and I went back to Orlando, I went to that site and I got a writing job, which was like paid nothing, but it was my first work online. And then within six or seven months after that, I was already getting like paid contract from um, IBM and another one, but it was like writing stuff. So I started by blogging and then um, UN was like, can you help us with some analysis on the refugee camp and stuff. So that, I mean, it was, um, what I would do now is different than what I did then, just because, well, for many reasons, one is it's a different landscape in the data space. So there was no competition then. So you get all the, you just get to imagine getting all of the attention, <laughs> no one else out there like making anything, which was pretty much what it was. So, um, but now, that's actually what I did. I just blogged and I got jobs, but that's actually not what I tell my clients to do um, necessarily. Cause you don't want to just be taking any job and every job that comes to you or even good ones. Sometimes you have to say no to good work because it's not in your wheelhouse and it's not going to be scalable to you. It's not going to be scalable for you in terms of like bringing in support because there's no systems if it's just some random thing. So you got to like start like really getting narrow about who you serve and how you help them and what you have to offer. And then you can build processes and make that super efficient where it doesn't take your time. And then if you customize, it's got to be, you know, big bucks. So awesome. what I did then is not what I would recommend doing now. Do as I say, not as I, as I did, right? 
Right. Well, I tell my clients, you know, like, yes, blog, you need to do something to create an audience and to help, help people, you know, um, give, <laughs> build a community and stuff. But that's not like, that's all I knew how to do, basically. And that's not, if, if you just know how to write a blog post, I don't know how effective that would be to getting the kind of business that's going to be leading to not just a profitable you know, business or freelancing side hustle, whatever, but also not just profitable, but scalable, like yes. manageable, basically. <laughs> that is the issue. That is the part of my business that I, that I currently struggle with. So I, I can definitely relate to that. I mean, I, I, I have to imagine there is still value in, in blogging and finding that place where there isn't competition. Is that something that you recommend? Yeah, so sure. it's like, you know, I'm blogging, but it's about a very, specific thing and if i own that one domain let's say it's like data data science in uh like security encryption and my blog is exclusively about that my business is in that exactly. vertical that's where it creates the most value right that's what you have to do is just basically like my clients first thing in in my course first thing first thing they do is just put them through a lot of market research because they have to find that area of where there is low supply and high demand and it matches their like natural like passions and interests and then they can they can they can place their they can put their flag there then hopefully their skill set too content. right yeah well I'm, it's okay. for data it's for data professionals so no one's joining that isn't a data professional of course but yeah awesome awesome <laughs> so one thing that that i'm always curious about, you know, we're talking about how you kind of broke into the entrepreneurial space with the copywriting, with the blogging, and then eventually the contracts coming in. Do you have any words of warning or words of advice for someone? Let's say I'm a data scientist. I like what I do, but I want to explore some of the more entrepreneurial ventures. I want to do some consulting outside of my, my day job. Um, first, like, are there things I should be careful of? And second, how, you know, what's the best thing I can do to, to take that step? Um, yeah, so I would say that if you're just getting started and you're building out like a side hustle, first of all is um, don't like, don't quit your day job until you've got a business set up for yourself. Something where you're getting some people coming in that are paying you for, uh, there's an exchange of money happening. Um, because that'll give you some sort of safety net. Uh, the other thing is, I can just say like, yeah, I, I actually have so much to say on this. Um, data professionals, we're, we're smart and we teach ourselves a lot. So we feel like business should be easy, that that is something that we should just be able to figure out. I mean, it's not rocket science. And um, so the natural inclination for most data professionals is to just, you know, start doing things and figuring it out trial and error like you would figure out most things. Um, so I did that and I, you know, like I said, I blogged here, I did that there and I left my job and then I was doing this other random thing in the data space here and then this here and, trying to figure out, like I created this R course and I did this and I did that. And I just thought that I was gonna teach myself how to build this really cool business by just build, like figuring out one piece at a time. And yes, I did figure out some things on my own, but um, it takes a lot of time and it's really hard. And what I discovered about four years into that trial and error approach is that I could hire someone <laughs> who has already done this and they could tell me all of the tricks and exactly what I need to do in order to get the result I'm looking for. And I wouldn't have to do trial and error anymore. Basically someone, they're just, people are just spilling the secrets on what works. And so once I started hiring, so that was like my first business coaching, I took a course first and then it was a program. Now I'm totally addicted. So I have business coaching, like spent like 50 grand on it so far. But when I look back, cause it was just like right away, I went from like making just enough money to like 
live and travel the world, which is awesome, but still um, to, you know, multiple six figures, like right away. So when I look back at the four years that I spent, like basically wasting my time trying to, because I thought I was being smart by not investing, like, oh, I'll figure this out. I'll save my money by, um, by figuring out myself and not paying for courses and stuff. I actually lost $800,000 because I spent four years wasting my time and my time went to multiple six figures, like right away after I started working with coaches. You see what I'm saying? So it like comes out to like a million dollars in lost revenue plus four years of time that I just spent. And you're like, yes, there was value in it and experience is always valuable. But now I would say like, whatever it is, Like, yeah, if you want to try and figure it out, but like the sooner you can figure out, like get some sort of idea of what you want to do and then hire someone to help you achieve that, whatever it is, you know, that has done this before, has demonstrated results, um, that is going to be a game changer for, that's what I would recommend. Awesome. Well, I think that there's, yep, that's true for everything, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. I, I think a, a very simple, hopefully now anal- analogy that the most data scientists would, would, would resonate with is that, you know, you look at, at, at any of these machine learning algorithms, there, there are modules that are already created that you can use to run them. And you don't have to go through and, and code them all from scratch to be able to use these things. And so yeah, granted, a lot of these things are free, but they're tools that have already been done. They're, they're already very well built and it makes sense for you to to use them to get the end results you, you want. And if you have your own time and you really wanna learn how they work under the hood, you should do that, but you shouldn't be dedicating your full time or, or a lot of your time because you think it'll save time uh, to building it from scratch, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, you know, I, th- that resonates with me. I'm actually, I'm starting to realize I have to spend quite a bit more money on my business or, or hiring people or doing those types of things to to essentially buy myself more time and buy myself more future income, whatever that might be. And it is it's a, expensive. Yeah, I spend like a lot on my business. I think like 8,000 a month right now. And it's going to go up once I start running ads. It's a lot. It sucks. But you know what? Like I could do more work and save that money, but then I wouldn't be happy. I'd be just like, we were talking about, you know, I don't want to run myself into the ground. You can't be like thriving and in your zone of genius if you're like a slave. So what do you want to be like a slave to your vision? Like, oh, I quit my day job where I was working as like, um, you know, for someone else doing what they said. And now I'm a slave to my own vision. Like that doesn't make any sense. So I would rather make less profits and have that space to just like throw, throw to, to show up and like be present in like, be in that zone where like the ideas and the magic can flow and can come to me. And that I feel like I'm connected with purpose, you know, which is very hard if you're working all the time, which is the tendency. You know, it's, it's also, I think you'd mentioned the slave to the vision type of thing. And that, that's something I'm like deathly afraid of because I know I'm my own like biggest critic, right? Like usually people that have the entrepreneurial bug to a certain extent, we're like the hardest on ourselves because we want our, our dreams to become a reality. And so it's like, well, you know, I want this to happen. I want this to happen so bad. Um, it's hard yeah. to turn it off when you're your own boss. If, if you're going into the office every day, you can choose when you go, don't go to the office, whatever it is. But this is it, so much what I've been thinking about lately. Yeah. But you're at home. But you know why though, Ken? <laughs> the deal is, is that I, I came up with this, I think it was just two days ago. I'm, I started this little journal here of like things I'm going to share. It's like lifestyle and philosophy. Here's the deal. Your like subconscious mind or whatever you want, you want to call it, it knows what you want, right? And it is so much more powerful at processing information than your conscious mind. There's so much more processing capability. So you and your inner self know what you want. And there is a way where your brain can sit there and try and figure out each little step. And there are infinite possibilities for the next step you could take. So your path, the pathway your brain will figure out is like really convoluted and will like take you through lots of painful points. And it's not that much fun. 
Um, and that would be like the control, like work it out, like work path, right? Just work hard and you're gonna get to where you want to go, which is what we're always taught. Or you could try and make space. We can make space for ourselves. And this is what Tim Ferriss says he spends most of his time doing. Make space for yourself and let your subconscious work it out. Let the universe come in and deliver to you. Like instead of trying to figure it out, let that direct path come to you. And then you don't have to like be going through all these iterations, trying to figure things out. Like if you know what you want and you give your brain space, just you give yourself space to be, the direct path to that is going to be a lot more clear, you know, than if you're like stuck working 16 hours a day and I'm just laughing because I've done it and like trying to control the outcomes. It's just, there's no space for your subconscious brain to even get an idea through. If that makes sense. No, I, I think that there's a tremendous amount to that. I mean, I've heard that echoed in quite a few books. So I read, I'm trying to think of what it was called. So there's one called, um, oh my goodness. It's by, it's by the guy who does deep work and another one, it's called digital minimalism. And essentially oh. the idea is that, you know, we're on our phones so much that our brains are never turned off. They're always stimulated, right? And evolutionarily, if we look back hundreds, thousands of years, like we were in a cave literally doing nothing. Like that's a, a good thing for our brain to have room to, to work out problems and, and to just digest things. I mean, that's also the power of meditation. That's the power of just putting everything down. It's because historically, our brains have had a lot of time to just do nothing and defragment. But in, mm -hmm. you know, 20, since 20, like 2000, I don't know, 2005 or wherever cell phones came to be, um, or like the advancements in technology, we don't, we don't have any free time anymore. And not, and like, like real free time where we're walking in the woods, where we're spending time with our family, where we're doing uh, like, like positive, but brainless activities. Um, unless we create it, unless exactly. we set those boundaries for ourselves. Yeah. So I, I, I believe I, that's something I need to do better at as well. I try to like walk outside without my phone for, you know, 30 minutes a day. I try to exercise without any electronics, that's but, great. but it's hard, right? It, it's especially for if, some reason it's <laughs> harder because it's like, it's giving up, it's surrendering control. So if you're working or trying to figure, you know, you're doing it, I don't know what it is, but I was, the another thing I was thinking about putting in this little, they, that made it into the journal was like, okay, how do you, when you're an entrepreneur, how do you separate work? If you're so passionate about what you do, like, is me, if I go to the beach club and I record these kind of lifestyle philosophy type videos at a beach club, chilling, you know, drinking some lemonade, is that work or is that lifestyle is that having fun because yes i'm going to use it for work but it's talking about like lifestyle and philosophy and it's chilling at a beach club so is that fun like what are the lines you know you have to draw kind of clear lines and say okay i'm not gonna work now yeah well i think that's really hard because let's let's take a typical like youtube content creator right uh -huh. like for someone like myself i make videos and a podcast that pervade, that like conveys utility, right? Someone learns something from it. But the holy grail of any of these platforms is that they watch your content just to see you, right? Because you're producing it, because they're your fan. Uh, it's very different than they're just coming in to get useful information from you. So a I wouldn't say that this is my higher goal, but for a lot of creators, the end goal is to just be able to make videos about their life and whatever they're doing and essentially get paid money to do those things because you're sharing your experiences and because people like you, they're going to watch. And that makes that line even more blurry, right? It's like, I'm doing what I would do on a day-to-day -day basis. I am being myself, but that is also my job. So being yourself is a job as well. And that, that to me is like, a really scary thing like you are your own personal brand which is also your business and you literally can never turn it off because that's like essentially like when the camera's on it's on and the camera's always on uh but that's also like what is it's most celebrated personal. or what everyone's chasing after right so 
I think it's very personal. So like each person needs to sit down for themselves. Like if you were to try and make these boundaries for yourself, like what, I think it's a matter of like, how do you feel after you're doing it? Do I, would I feel like if the beach club, I went and I talked about these little lifestyle videos, like would I feel like I had worked? The answer is yes. I would feel like, and you know, if I get on my phone and I'm like doing whatever, con, you know, how does it make me feel? And if it makes me feel like it took something from me, even if it's giving energy to you, like if it's taking energy from you, it's definitely work. If it's giving energy to you, even that is can be work. So it's like, you have to just figure out like, what are these actions basically? Like break it down. Cause you can't really control your thoughts and what you're thinking about, but you can set a limit on this action qualifies as work. And this qualifies as not work and just don't let yourself do those work activities sometime, which I'm definitely, this is like something that's all, these are new downloads for me. So I'm like, okay, how do I actually bring this into like implement it? You know? No, I mean, honestly, I, it's refreshing to hear that, that you're thinking about these same things because it's, these are things that I'm constantly thinking about. I mean, let's take YouTube, for example, right? For, for the longest time, YouTube was completely my leisure activity. It was my hobby, right? And I mean, now for better, obviously, it is something that does generate me some income. It is something that I care really seriously about, but it does cross the boundary between it being like leisure and, and work now. And so now this thing that was once like my greatest release or my greatest like outside of work passion does have work strings attached to it. And yeah. like I in, in effect have no control over that, right? It's that like when something reaches a certain size, it's like, well, if I wanna maintain this, I have to give this a certain amount of attention. Um, and I wonder what strings you can pull to like maybe move it back more towards leisure or, or, or like maybe move it even completely into work so it's in its own compartment. Um, but I would love to hear whatever you find around those things because definitely, definitely stuff that I struggle with and I'm trying to better understand as well. Awesome. I'll let you know. I'll keep in touch about it. Awesome. <laughs> I'll okay, make that. a video eventually, I guess. Well, I'm happy to guess in that <laughs> video if you need someone to just sound really yeah. confused the whole time. <laughs> we need to do, yeah, we need to do collaborations. Okay, so let me point out to you that the videos I'm going to do for lifestyle and philosophy, I'm not putting those on YouTube just because right now where I'm at in my channel and like, I don't know if it will ever be a place where they'd want where people on YouTube wants to see my lifestyle stuff maybe, but um, so it's more going to be like that to me would be more appropriate in a Facebook group or in a stories environment where people are getting a special insider glimpse into, you know, like more personal things, but like, what like for YouTube for me that's like a lot of just people are there to you know what I'm seeing is that people are there to learn like things that are super valuable they're not so much there to connect with they don't really care about like my lifestyle I don't think well who knows <laughs> it's if, just what, yeah people yeah. in the comments let us know if you if you want to learn about Lillian's <laughs> lifestyle down there so <laughs> I, that, honestly that was one of my favorite tangents that we've had on the show because that was really like relevant to me I would like to dial things back a little bit and talk about your experience. I guess this isn't that far off what we're talking about, but your experience like working in another country. I mean, obviously you grew up in the US, you've, you've obviously traveled quite a bit, but what was it like to relocate to another country, run your business from there? Was that something that you think was good for all of this? And you know, in the same sense of what we were talking about before, is that something you'd like recommend? Yeah. 100% it made it so much easier and like so much more wonderful so like I quit my job and I moved to Thailand and you know my brand story is I lived off of like I turned down a second interview with Facebook and Menlo Park and I moved to Chiang Mai Thailand and I lived off of $600 per month so that's like okay that sounds like a kind of like drastic thing to do and what would that be like I'll tell you what it was like it was like sleeping 16 hours a day. It was like getting a massage every single day of the week. It was like not having to worry about 
money or traffic or laundry or anything and just getting to be a human being for like a long, 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 long time before I actually started working hard again. And that was able, I was able to do that because I could live and manage like a good quality of life in Chiang Mai for $600 a month. So I didn't have to worry about making a ton of money and I could just be a human being. Whereas if, you know, if you stay in a Western country, it's like, you've got to get, there's a high overhead. So it didn't like, for me, it was optimal because it just like gives me space. And now things are different. And like, I have a much, cause I have a child. So my like expectations on myself in terms of revenues and profits is like, <laughs> So, like before I didn't care about making money. So it was just wonderful. It was like pretty much being like almost retired. And now it's really like a real business and I have goals and objectives and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, moving to a foreign country makes it, it can make it a lot easier, particularly Thailand. Also Bali is really nice because you can just have such an exceptional, I mean, you can live like a freaking celebrity and it's like same same cost of living as if you are willing to spend the same amount of money you would spend in america you can have like so we have full cooking full cleaning all the laundry no traffic all of it's just taking care of beach clubs it's like makeup artists all that just for same as like if i lived in like a small little house in america so i really like that and i like having the disposable income um, but I would say you have to be careful. So one thing I'd watch out for or think about is you got to think about your, one thing I did was I moved to Cusco because I thought it was a cool place because I visited there. And um, what it's like to live somewhere long-term is just so, so different from what it's like to visit. So you have to think about your requirements, like what kind of weather you can deal with. Uh, what are the internet? What's like the internet? What are the roads like? What are the, what's the internet like there? Um, what's the temperature like there? What's the cost of living? What's the traffic? All of that stuff, things you don't pick up on when you visit someplace that might be really cool. But then when you live there and you're in it every single day, you're like, I can't even tolerate this. Like in Peru, I was sick all the time because of the um, sanitation issues and the weather, there wasn't enough oxygen because it was up in the Andes. And um, the internet wasn't that good, you know? And it was like, there was nothing I could do with Peru. So I moved here after having learned that lesson. And the lesson is always think about what you need in order to live long-term and be happy and healthy and safe and make sure the place has that instead of like just the, you know, the, the highlights reel you get when you're traveling that doesn't, isn't gonna keep you happy long-term. Do you think, you know, from those experience, it's sustainable to do like work travel. I think that that's like a newer phenomenon where you spend like a couple months here, a couple months there, or, you know. Yeah, uh, I did that. Like Peru, I moved all around Peru. I did that for about over a year actually. Um, so yeah, that's a good idea. My husband did that too before he met me. And there's a lot of people out there, a lot of really cool people doing all sorts of things like that. So, and then you just pick a place. Like if you find a place that is like, this is just awesome, then you stick around, you know, but. Interesting. That's something personally I've been, I don't know why I've just been, I've been scared to do it. Um, but it also seems oh, like something that- Hawaii is enjoy, pretty yeah. similar. That is true. I, I think the cost of living in Hawaii is, is a little <laughs> higher than most of the- uh, <laughs> Dude, you should come to freaking Koh Samui. You would love it. Or like go to Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai's got all the people. And you can like get now, um, now, just like this last week, they've opened up a, a visa or like a passport for if you have the shot, you know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, and then you just have a three-day quarantine and then you're free. And like, dude, there's no, it's like, my island where I live is like, no one is here. It's empty because oh, there's no travelers. So there's no economy. So what I'm saying is you can get like glorious places to stay for like cents on the dollar. Like Thailand's already very affordable, but now because we're so hard hit with the pandemic, you can just get, you can like get a castle for like the same 
as a like a one bedroom rent in New York City. You know, it's incredible. So if you can like get out of there and come to Thailand right now, this is like it's the the getting is very good. Interesting. Well, one of my uh, a couple of my good friends, you you included, are out there. My my aunt lives out there now. I think so. Uh, there, there's a good chance I make it out in the next in the next year or so. Um, cool. I'm trying to think. You know, I um, I've never done Southeast Asia before. I've been to China. I've been to a lot of South America as well. But Southeast Asia is a place that I love the food and I think the culture is fascinating. So, you know, I'll probably be out it's there. It's nothing like ever. China. It's nothing like China. Don't ever worry. It's nothing like China. I will not. I don't know if you like China, but China wasn't my, China was not my thing, man. (laughs) What? Yeah, it was, it was a bit crowded for my taste. Um, I'd be interested to go back. So I'm, I'm half Chinese. My dad's Chinese. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, the last time I was there was in, I think 20, 2010. And, um, the crazy thing about China is that 2010 is different from 2012 is different from 2014 is different from, you know, 2020 is different from 2021 because the place grows so fast, you know? Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. All right. So it's like, I think the experience now for better, for worse would be completely different than my experience. Then the one thing I remember when I was there, so I went to Shanghai, Beijing, Xi'an, um, and a couple other places. I'd like to go to Hong Kong. I've never been there before was that everything was under construction. That's like my most vivid memory is I was like, wow, everything's under construction, I think it's always like right? that. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, it's like, wow, like, you, you know, we see our cities in the US grow, things like that, but I've never been to a place where like, I could probably go somewhere a couple different years at a time and be like, this is unrecognizable from how it was before. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll see if that, um, you should check out, when I went to Beijing, I hopped over to Kathmandu in Nepal and then back over. Definitely if you ever get that. Well, it's it's got its own, depends on your style, but I really loved it. Especially, it sounds like you're introspective and spiritual to some degree. And in that case, like Bali and Kathmandu are just really, really wonderful places to visit. I only have two last questions. Um, so the okay. first is around how you built your, your flourishing online presence so whether that's on linkedin whether that's on twitter you know did that all stem from the blogging you were doing the your ability to write copy or are there some other things that helped you really you know build a community and and help gravitate people towards you um yeah good question um how i did it was that i started using social analytics early on and so i could look at my post and i I was combining yoga with data in one channel before and Twitter. And I saw like once I posted myself in my yoga clothes and I lost like 60 followers. So I realized that I needed to separate and have all data and all, if I want a yoga thing, it needs to be on a separate brand, not to be trying to mix into like things that people don't care about. And that was like my first experiment with social analytics and it's just like following the analytics is everything if you want to grow an online community. And another thing is bringing in tools to help. So Twitter, especially Twitter's just like automation central. So if you're on Twitter, you, you should be using automation. And if you're doing LinkedIn, there's still a lot of like tools you can use to help. Like, um, so I, you, I, we schedule my posts, you know, we schedule things and I can have my team members schedule things and they go out. So it's not automation, but it's automate, you know, it's support, it's software support. And so that helps a lot too. Um, yeah. And so there's like, and then I'm not, I wasn't a great copywriter by any means. So I think the bigger thing was that just to show up and be authentic and be who you are and let that shine through and then make sure that, you know, like what you're covering is um, check out the, check out the market research. So like, you don't want to be a lot of what I see is like people all doing the same thing, which doesn't make any sense at all because that's just a bunch of noise. So 
and like say if you're a data you're like doing it you're a data professional a data want to start a data consulting business you would not want to try and grow a community of other data professionals because data professionals don't need to buy data services from other data professionals because they're already data professionals so you would want to build a community around helping a sub niche like someone that doesn't actually have your expertise and how do they use data like entrepreneurs or marketing leaders or you know oil and gas leaders how they could use data to get results in their line of business that is not data so you have to do the research and find like where is there a big need for what i have to offer and then um and then niche down you know and double down in those areas but a lot and not do. So the natural inclination is if you do what you see other people doing that you think is working, but then that means that everyone is doing the same thing. So it's tough. And I would say like you, you it, like flourishing is all relative. So the word flourishing you said is like, so you, to me, you're like, you have like a video on YouTube that has like almost a million of views. I don't think my website has ever gotten a million views, like maybe a million views total over like 10 years. Like, um, so you say flourishing, and, but it's all relative. So like, yeah, there's times when things go really, really, really well, but it's all just like incremental drops in the bucket. And the big thing is like, like day to day, I have no control over how, you know, the, um, the internet responds to whatever I'm doing and how people respond, but I do have control over my intentions and what am I here to do? And, and I want to help, you know, my mission is to support data professionals and to becoming world-class data leaders and entrepreneurs. And so if I go into something with that intention of like helping people and like just being letting you know, letting things fall into place the way they should instead of trying to make it happen, that's gonna be um, that's gonna be the best thing. But use the data analytics, use the social analytics, use the tools <laughs> and try and just keep the perspective because like getting incremental, it's gonna be so frustrating. You know, you want something and you're like, I'm on this little thing, I put so much into it, it's not doing what I want it to do. It, you know, Zooming it's like, out. it's a long game. Yeah, zooming out, looking at the big picture, I think with all, uh, you know, with all social media is the is the key because, you know, if we look at it, it's like really silly, like, oh, you know, my picture only got this many likes, I'm so disappointed at that, like, that that's not what drives any happiness or business growth. That's saying like, you know, <laughs> I put I'm putting all these things out in the world and and on the aggregate, hopefully people are enjoying it, and one little thing isn't gonna, you know. Uh, it's not a straw that broke the camel's back scenario, I would hope. Uh, you know, I'm always thinking, and it's my biggest thing, like, okay, so one of the things that drove me to be an entrepreneur is like looking at like, how, what am I going to, what is it going to be like when I die? When I look back on my life, what do I want to like, I don't want to feel like I didn't live. I don't want to feel like I didn't go 100% in everything that I ever wanted to do. So I did what, you know, I became an entrepreneur. I did that. I did that. But I don't want to also, I don't want to, at the end of my life, look back and say, I wish I hadn't worried so much about things that didn't matter. I spent so much of this like gift of life, like just trying to make things happen on the things that just didn't matter. So like, so it's like, it just, a, it's like one of those things you have to like take that mindset with you every single, like for me, I have to like think about that. I think about it all the time, you know, like what is it going to be like, like, is this really the life I want to live ultimately on a day-to-day -day basis? What is this leading to? But about tools, I did want to mention the social media tools I use and the analytics tools I use in my business, what I use to hit multiple six figures. I cover them all inside the data entrepreneur toolkit which is a free toolkit of 32 tools and biz, uh, tools and processes that will actually grow your data business. So um, it's a PDF and you can get it if you want. I will link to where you can get that below in the description. And then really the last thing that I have is uh, at the end of each interview, I like to open the floor 
to whoever I'm interviewing to talk about something that they care about. Usually I, I enjoy it when it's something, I, I would imagine we've shared quite a few things in this interview that you haven't in other <laughs> interviews previous, but you know, if there's anything that really sticks out, any advice that you have um, or any just final thoughts that you wanna share, you're welcome to it. Gosh, okay, so yeah, there is, there is, there is. It does, it just happens to dovetail into this data superhero quiz thing, but I want to touch on it because it's really important for people who aspire to be data scientists, I think. Um, data science can be used in all, so there's 50, there's 50, over 54 different types of data roles out there, many of which require data science that aren't called quote unquote data scientists. And those roles can be divided into different categories. So how I divide them up is data leader roles, data entrepreneur roles, data entrepreneur, and then data, um, data implementer. And so if you find yourself, like for me personally, I got all skilled up to work in data science, be a data scientist. Oh, they said it's so sexy. And then I got all the skills and I'm like, I don't want to do this. That doesn't mean that there's, if you feel empty, like if you get this skill set and you're like, this isn't like lighting my fire, just know that there are other application areas. There's, there's probably other things you can do with that same expertise and have just an incredible career utilizing that expertise and just in a different way. So a lot of people don't know that going in. Um, I didn't know that. And that's something I just discovered after you know, after I learned everything and I wouldn't go back and unlearn anything, but I would suggest like tapping into that. So um, that is why I have made that data superhero quiz is to help people like see where their personality and their passion and their skill sets align, like where they're going to feel like they thrive because there is a place, you know, but it's not, not everyone needs to be a data scientist. <laughs> no, I agree. I mean, it wasn't until I was working in industry that I realized that there's all these project management roles, there's product owner roles, there's UI, there's UX, there's um, designers, there's people who, who fit into this data ecosystem that are like on the creative side. And there are some that are like purely on the engineering side. And it's like a very broad spectrum. And, you know, frankly, now with all the content that I create and, you know, I, I would say that I almost have some of an artistic side. I might have gravitated yeah. towards some of those other types of roles if I if I had known about them. I obviously enjoy what exactly. I do now, but it's like the world's a lot bigger than just data scientist, data analyst, data engineer, machine learning engineer. <laughs> There's so much but more. It wasn't ecosystem. like that before. I, I will say that this is because data has become it's a it's kind of grown in. It's like it's spreading across all knowledge work. So it was not like that before. Like they didn't have machine learning engineer when I started. Data scientists just got a name, 2012. It got a name as data science. People were already doing it. You see what I'm saying? But now it's like becoming such like this big thing and there's so many options and you can have so, so much fun. So if you find you don't want to spend your days like building these, whatever it is, I'm just saying that that's okay. Don't force yourself because it's where when you show up and you're authentic in who you are and you're really tapped into your like passions and your talents, that's where you're going to offer the world the most value. And so happens you're going to be happier there too. And you're probably going to make more money than if you try and do something because you think it's the right thing to do, even though it might not feel that good. No, I, I could not agree more. I mean, something that absolutely grinds my gears is when people tell me they're getting into data science for the money. I think it's like a, a fairly profitable career. You make a good living, but the amount of work that you have to put in to make the same amount of money as like a software engineer, for example, it doesn't make sense. Like you should just go become a software engineer because the amount of education, the amount of school, whatever that is you need is less and you can make essentially the same income. Right. And so it's like, okay. I'm a big believer that you should follow, um, follow, the intrinsic things that you like about the career. Maybe you like solving the problems. Maybe you like working with the people. Maybe you like building stuff. And inevitably those things lead you to be good at that career vertical. And then it leads you to make money either way. So it's kind of like- Exactly. There's so, if you have data expertise, 
honestly, you're just like, you're already the cream of the crop. It's not like everyone needs a data scientist. They probably do, but they need data. People need data skills and data expertise in every incremental little aspect of business. There's just so much potential. And if you can get results, which you can, if you're using the data, the money is going to come. I could not agree more. Well, again, that's, that's really all I had, Lillian. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank I really enjoyed me. it. Yeah, no problem. Hey, me too. I always love talking. I always love talking to you, Ken.